Please be seated. <clears throat> In the name of the main character, and of its harem, and of the holy waifu, Kawaii Asu. This is the Radical Rad Podcast. Hello everybody, hope you brought your finest waifu paraphernalia with you, and welcome to The Church of Weeb, episode number three, this being the review of the summer 2019 anime, specifically episodes seven to nine. Adam aka ACS Radical here with you guys, happy to be back again here on The Church, and let's just get right into it. So we are at episode seven to nine, so we have reached the near end point of this season, as I've said before, the same eight shows still apply here. At this point, I don't think I'm dropping anything. I think it's pretty clear at this point that these shows will survive biting a crazy, crazy shit turn of events in the next couple episodes. I think the latest I've ever dropped a show was episode 10, so if it survives one more week, I think we'll be seeing them all at the, uh, the season finale episode of this podcast. Obviously, with some of these shows, they are going further into this. As far as I know, I know Dr. Stone is. I don't know if there's any others that will. I know most of these aren't. The only one I'm not sure about is Adamachi Season 2, but either way. So, this has been a mixed bag. There are some shows that have suddenly shot into the major, major high point of my tiers of, of shows that I've watched as... I have consumed more than 200 shows now. And then some shows have turned into, well, I guess we're just going to finish them and then we'll probably forget about them when the season ends. Which shows are they? Well, uh, I guess we'll start telling you right now, won't we? So let's start in alphabetical order as we always do on the show with Are You Lost? I will say the same thing that I said last week, or last uh, episode, I should say. It is a show that is not doing anything too special at this point. It is a short, it is quick and to the point, has a few jokes here and there, doesn't completely, like, it, I'm not fully invested in the show. It's more of something I can turn my brain off and just kind of enjoy it. Yes, it is very waifu baity. There is a, quite a lot of etchy in there, especially in these last few episodes. They've been definitely uh, walking around in their underwear or naked more often than they usually do. So I think they've probably separated the audience to, to being the people that are more into this stuff anyway because that's kind of where the show has been going to begin with. Altogether, I mean, the show is, it is what it is. Like I've said before, it is a show that's not going to take too much. I, I like the idea that I can just sit down, turn on this 10 minute episode and just turn my brain off, not think about anything. I don't have to remember shit. I don't have to really like think too hard about what's going on. It's just watch, chuckle at a few things and then be done with it. And, and I'm more than happy with that. Now, as we get to the end of this podcast, I'll talk about Magical Senpai, which is doing the polar opposite, where it's becoming fucking fantastic for me. But um, it, this show just, it it really has kept on the same the same path and hasn't diverted from it. Homare is still the key piece. The other three are hit and miss at times. I mean, you, the only reason that I remember one of the other girls' names, that being Shion, is because she's annoying as shit, so that's kind of her role. The other two, I just can't remember. The sporty girl has her moments. The brainy girl is kind of has her moments, I guess, too, but not not really. She's just kind of still in the background. But all things considered, I mean, the show does what it does. It it has those few gross out moments or those few moments where you're like, man, I'd be fucking dead if I was stranded on an island by this point, and yet here they are just surviving. And apparently somehow, like, this girl as a kid in Homare, like, spent her entire childhood learning how to survive the wild. So it's like, holy shit, what a weird childhood she's had. She just happens to know an answer to everything. So it's like, Jesus Christ. But um, it, it really is what it is. The show is just, it's its nothing. It's just nothing that's going to challenge you. I will forget about the show when the season's done. You know, it's, it's just one of those shows that you enjoy for when it's there, and then that's the last time you'll ever see anything about it. So... I'm not even going to spend too much time on this one. And it'll probably be like that on the finale episode where I'm just going to be like, look, they, unless they get saved at the end, which I'm not convinced they will, you know, there's not going to be too much to talk about. So 
We'll move on to Do You Like Your Mom? Her normal attack is two attacks at full power. This show is a mixed bag still. They've gotten past the Medi uh, little arc that they had going on here. It kind of ended a little bit terribly. Um, they try really hard to make her mother seem a little more like she meant well and then just lost her way, but I still cannot get except the fact that like she twisted and turned all the way into being a good mother in five seconds flat. And it's one of those things that like they're they're taking a partially real look at what some families are like in terms of the uh, parent um, child relationship and when they go in this direction when you like take a look at what happened with Wise's mother and now Medi's mother it's really difficult to accept the anime nature of it just flipping the script and everything's okay suddenly because there is some deep rooted bullshit that goes on with those relationships and it's it's one of those things that just feels off you know, even though the game, even though the anime itself is as ridiculous and over the top as it possibly can be, there's still that brief moment where you're thinking like, okay, but I'm still invested because there is a real heavy relationship going on here that needs to be resolved, and it's not being resolved at a proper pace. It's just basically, oh my god, I understand now, and just a brief cry, and then it's all over because you know apparently that's what women do is they is they cry amongst each other whenever they're, you know, overcoming a problem, which, you know, it's an anime cliche, but it is what it is. But altogether, the show is, it's, it's moving along and it's at the same time retaining the comedy that kind of brought me back into it when I wasn't too sure about it in the very beginning. But it's also starting to run its course, I think. Uh, this is a show that I believe that by the time it's done, I will have had my fill and not want to see a second season. It's not going to be near the, it's not going to be the absolute bottom. I will save that for Are You Lost and one more show I'm going to get to shortly. But this show is definitely going to be one of those ones where I don't think there's really anything you can do to give it a second season. And I would even wonder if this is a manga, how the hell they keep it going. Because uh, it's it's getting old very fast. It's not to the point that I'm done with it, but I feel like in three more episodes, I might be. They're trying to at least give it a little more interest with now another girl, that being, uh, shit, what was her name? I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she runs this, I guess, gang of all these kids that have just accepted that, you know, they're stuck in this world and they're staying away from their parents. So it's just a bunch of, well, realistically, it's her and a bunch of guys at this point. So I, I feel like there's more to it than we're seeing at this point. But she's an absolute dipshit moron that falls on her ass several times and and whatever else. And almost in a way is a Cinderia that gives away all her secrets without, you know, <laughs> it's like she's saying, I'm never going to tell you this and then proceeds to tell you it. And they immediately every time go, you just said it. So it, she is kind of funny, and I think that hopefully she is at least able to carry the last few episodes of the show forward without it being, like I said, getting too old, because it is. And as much as Monaco does not annoy me as much as she used to in the early going, I think it's less because I'm warming up to her, more as I've just gotten used to it, and it doesn't bug me nearly as much now. But either way, that that character is still going to remain like one of the one of the more not so good ones that I've seen as a main character in an anime and the show itself I feel like it's like I said it's just hitting the same two jokes that being mom ruins everything and son has to see his mom naked constantly or at least in various states of undress because that's a thing and all the other comedy tropes they try to put in there they use it so sparingly so that when they do happen i mean you laugh because you weren't you hadn't seen it in so long so you're not adjusted to it but you quickly just move back into this into this train of thought where you're thinking well we're just going to go back to the same stupid mom jokes and it's just it's just not working anymore it's it's not doing what it should be doing at this point it's becoming boring it's becoming stale and 
I'm just glad we're going to be getting through this one soon. I'm not, I don't hate the show. By the time that I finish this, unless they really pull some dumb shit at the end here, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I hate this show. I don't think I'm going to say I'm going to hate any of these shows by the end of it. It's just there are going to be a few that are like, I'm okay if I never have to see it again, sort of deal. And this is, I think, going to be one of them at the rate it's going. Next up, we're going to have Dr. Stone. So the the longer that the show keeps going, the more that I keep wondering, okay, is this is this where it starts to starts to get a little too mainstream for me again. And I think I'm at the point now that I don't think it's going to. And if it, if it already has, I have not become um, aware of it. It continues to impress me. It continues to be a lot of fun to watch. Very interesting. And now we're getting to the point where we're seeing the real fruits of labor when it comes to Senku's work. So in the past, these past three episodes, electricity is now a thing. It's not a common thing, he finally generated the first light. And we also have been introduced to a new character in Gen, who is, I guess the best way to put it is he's one of those, um, he's one of those guys that in a way is a magician, but also somebody that is very good at being able to lie and being able to perceive people's thoughts and fuck with them, almost like he's a spy in a sense. And I personally don't care for him but it seems like they are going to use him as a bit of extra comic relief as if we need any more and a bit more of mystery. I feel like he could still eventually stab Senku in the back as this anime progresses. And I think that's part of what his role is going to end up being is that he's going to be a guy that you're not sure because he's only playing to his self-interest and it might change. I mean, sure, right now he is on Senku's side because of electricity and because of as we see at the end of episode 9, he's going to get his first cola in 3,700 years. But he's one of those guys that you look at and you figure that there's more to this. It's not as simple to just win him over and that's it. It feels like they're trying to go through that formula as they keep adding new people into the roster by slowly exposing them to new things. But Gen is one of those ones that I am convinced is not going to be the same trope as all these other characters that he's coming across as we go further in this anime as well it's it's getting to a point now that i feel like by the time we hit the finale episode of this podcast we have to have a resolution with ruri and that being kohaku's sister who is sick and i don't mean just solving her illness i mean figuring out who the hell this girl is because i'm becoming very convinced that this girl and kohaku have nothing to do with each other and that there's a lot more about Ruri than we don't know. So, I mean, we'll see what happens with it, but at the end of the day, it's it's just one of those things where it's it's a story that's moving a lot slower, but because the show is not 12 episodes, but rather, I think, 24 or 25, they have time to work with. And I don't think this is a show that's going to end at 25 either. This is definitely going to be a long runner. And this might be one of the very few shows that are long running that I keep with. Um... I know, I don't know if they're going to keep going forward with it, but Radiant is a show that I feel is very much in that shonen vibe that I am still very much okay with being behind for an extended period of time. Although that one stopped, I don't know if it's coming back. But, you know, it's... Dr. Stone is definitely turning into a show that I am more than happy if this thing is 100 episodes and I just keep going through this as we go along. What'll be interesting, though, is... uh is when we get to our first episode of the fall series and I'll have to be like, okay, well, this is the one section where in the first three episodes, I have to spoil it because this is not episode one anymore. This is episode 13 or whatever it may be. So, you know, we'll see how it runs with that. But the one thing that I'm I'm definitely concerned about is that we have not seen Taiju or Yuzura for, I want to say, five episodes now. Like we haven't even seen. Like we were. We know they were supposed to be, like spying on Sukasa and staying with the group and trying to figure out what's going on, and we have not seen them, and that worries me. I mean, in a way, they could just be not concentrating on them at all. But it seems silly that a character like Taiju, who is so beloved in the first few episodes that this anime started, that you would want to keep him around, and the fact that we haven't seen him at any point in this makes me wonder what's going on, whether it's a matter of them being imprisoned, them being hurt, I wouldn't say killed, or even in the fact of they may be brainwashed. 
you know, there does seem to be to come a a thought in my head that wonders if the next time we see Taiju, he's going to have been brainwashed and attack Senku. I feel like that is a plot point that is very potentially possible and almost expected to me at this point because if you go this long without seeing them, there's a reason for it. I don't think they would just, you know, without thinking about it, not have them shown for a while because they were central characters. I mean, Yuzi Hira was literally a major plot point for the first few episodes because Taiju wanted to revive her so badly. And all of a sudden she comes up and two episodes later we haven't seen her again in a long time. So it's like, you figure there's got to be something going on. Now granted it might be nothing, but it's just one of those things that makes me worry just a little bit. And, you know, when we get to the later episodes, especially when we get to the crossover between the summer and the fall, that's when you would expect something to happen. And, you know, it's it's going to be one of those things where it's either going to be something really big or it's going to be literally nothing it's just going to be hey they're back you know it's going to be one or the other but either way the show is continuing to really tickle my fancy a lot more than i ever thought it would i've i'm getting pretty close to the point as i'm just quickly refreshing my memory on all the shows yeah for sure uh i think kohaku is going to be my favorite girl of the entire uh season as as much as i'm getting really close with um with tejina from magical senpai She's just, she's not, she's not Kahaku. Kahaku is freaking amazing. I love that girl. So she's probably going to end up being the runaway in this series. And, you know, as we continue forward, you know, I hope that she stays alive, first of all. And, you know, it continues to go forward. Speaking of alive, I was actually fooled for a moment that Gin was actually killed. I f forgot for a whole little bit there that he was a magician. So I didn't even think anything of it. The fact that he would have had blood packs, you know, to cover himself up just to be just to be sure he didn't get killed off so easy. Because he fi he probably figures that because of the way that he is, somebody would just happen to want to just punch him in the face at some point. So maybe protect himself a little better. But that was interesting. But yeah, like I said, that, that show has definitely impressed me a lot more than I've thought. And I'm very happy that as we're going to head into the final uh, episode of this season's reviews next in the next three weeks... Or maybe four, depending. I can't remember if any shows are 13 episodes or not. Um, I'm very happy that this show has not become what I thought it would and has stuck to what made me really interested in it in the first few episodes. So I'm very happy about that. Now we get to the fun one. And this is in a good way for once. So we get to Given. I said before that this show had my full attention from a musical standpoint. And... Now it has me at the emotional point as well. If you have watched the show and you've kept up to episode nine, so assuming you're still here and listening and not trying to you know, dodge the spoilers, we finally got our first song and we got Mafia to sing for the first time and we got the words. So for nine episodes, we had this whole plot of Ueno, Ueno Yama, I can't remember. I think his first name is Ritsuka. Yeah, it was Ritsuka. And he comes across Mafuyu, who, you know, seems like this just massive loof. Just nothing. Like, there, there's nothing going on upstairs. And him carrying around this guitar, he's never played it before. There's no story behind it. And as we've gone forward, we've seen the real heavy story that has fallen with it. We're still not given full closure on what happened. That being of Yuki, his Mafuyu's first boyfriend. Uh, we know that he's dead. We just don't know how or why. Um, we're, le we're left to be unsure whether it was an accident, whether it was natural causes, whether it was a suicide. We don't know. Based on the way that Mafuyu kind of got fucked up, you wonder if suicide is where it stems. But at the same time... I feel like there would be a little more guilt, so I wonder if it was just like maybe an axe, like he got into a car accident or something like that. So, but that's been a lingering thing for a while. And, you know, with Ritsuka having a massive affection now for Mafuyu and admitting to it, he's been trying to figure out how to show that, and he's been writing a song for Mafuyu that Mafuyu could sing what he's been humming for this entire series so far. 
and Moffat Hughes been unable to write the words. So you've had this, and we're not even talking about any of the other characters. We're literally just talking about these two as as we speak at this point. Ritsuka has been this guy who has had no drive to do anything, and all of a sudden Mafia comes along, and his drive is fully kicked into action. And here you got Mafia, who literally looks like he's just going by and just like trying to just you know not die and just wither away. And Ritsuka comes along and you know adds to it, and finally gives him something to go with, and also gives him his outlet finally to really put into words how he's felt since Yuki left him. And in episode 9, I wasn't thinking it was going to happen then. I thought that they were just going to play and he couldn't find the words and it would just be another time. And then all of a sudden, that first set, that first line of the song kicks in and he goes. And I reacted the same way that a lot of people did in the crowd in that anime where I was just like, oh shit, here we go. And... As a musician and as an anime viewer and as somebody who does have an emotional attachment to the show now, it affected me in a multitude of ways, this song. Because as a musician alone, there is a lot to it. The instruments themselves aside were very, very complex. The guitar in that song is fantastic and something that I wish I can learn to play, I hope. At some point, somebody either posts a tablature or somehow does it custom for Rocksmith so I can learn because it's hard to learn that song by ear because there's so much going on in the background so you can't hear every individual note remotely as easy. It would take a lot longer. But as a musician, I was lighting up listening to that song because I heard a lot of complex and very interesting riffs that are very fun sounding to play. And then you take his voice, Mafiyu that being, and you take it with, I've heard the song as it's properly recorded now, but they added a bit of a live filter to it. So it sounds like his vocals are coming through live instead of it being, now the instruments didn't sound like they were uh, live recorded. So they sounded more like it was a studio recording and put a little bit of an echo on it to give it that live feel. But Mafiyu's voice sounded like they recorded that separately and applied all the filters they would need to to make it seem like it was being done in a in an echoey room. And that sounded wonderful. So the musician part of me is already very happy. And then you get to the emotional part. So you get to reading the lyrics as it's translated. And you see all the things he's saying. And you truly see every bit of emotion that you have seen Mafiyu think about for the last nine episodes but never say and for him to to finally come up with those words to be able to come up with the emotions the expressions the thoughts all of the things that he's been unsure of all the things that he's had trouble being able to communicate to be able to put into words for him to be able to do that in the fashion that we are led to believe he didn't write and that they just came from him that time that moment in that place in that state of mind where he was clearly hurting by the end of the song he's crying and eventually has to walk off stage because he's just he's that fucked up from it like in a way he's happy because he's finally found the ability to say what he's been wanting to say for so long but there's also that point of in doing so he let out every emotion that he's either hidden or suppressed or just haven't had in his mind that he just has not been able to express all flood at the same time and it really did a number on me i didn't cry i didn't i was more blown away that i could have felt that wave of of just like almost shock happiness sort of a mixture just to be like man he finally got it out that was really cool and the song was so good that, you know, you it got that extra bonus hit of just... And again, as a musician, it, it, almost, it really blew me away from that aspect too. So I was already emotionally invested, but the addition of such a fantastically sounding track really put it over the edge for me. And for that specific song to go out, I was very happy because I was worried that they were just going to 
redo the intro because I've seen so many music shows where they just play songs that are already in the intro or the ending or whatever. And they not only didn't do that, but they came with another song that was far better than the song we hear in the intro. And I was blown away by it. I, I'm very happy and hopeful that that song is on Spotify or something that I can get a piece of and be able to listen to on my own time rather than just keep going back to Crunchyroll to turn that episode back on, which I've already done a couple of times. And then after all that, after all that emotion, you know, as Mafia goes off stage, Ritsuka joins him, you know, obviously for moral support. And when Mafia is kind of like trying to thank him as best he can, Ritsuka really gives him the ultimate you're welcome and thank you in return and gives us that first kiss. And now I've not watched a lot of BL anime. And the reason being that I find most BL anime is a little too campy and a little too over the top romantic. I said that when I did a review of, ah, oh shit, what was it? Either last season or the season before. It was a show about a guy who is considered like the sexiest a guy in Japan or something. He was an actor and another guy comes in and takes that spot from him and it ends up turning into this this yaoi romance. And right right off the very beginning, it gets very heavy and rough and lots of making out where it's, it doesn't carry the value. It doesn't carry the, the emotional attachment to it, whereas that show made it seem more like porn. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying more it's something that I'm not accustomed to. Whereas in this show, the emotional attachment to that first kiss means a whole lot more. So it doesn't, it doesn't end up being off-putting. I mean, fuck, I've watched so many harem animes that seeing two girls doing stuff or seeing a guy and a girl doing things is so completely like, I'm completely like washed away from any, any reaction to it now. So it doesn't mean anything to me anymore. But in this case, I'm still warming up to to yaoi in terms of anime i mean hentai is one other thing that, that's a whole other conversation but uh you know as i as i still am very new to my bisexuality having the ability to see stuff like this now and not be put off by it and especially in the case of given now that it finally has that moment and it isn't just off like it isn't off-putting to me but also has it also put a smile on my face and, and brought some joy to me and really hit some emotional highs on it because we were waiting for that for some time now, and it came out suddenly, and it came out at the perfect time at the same time. So, all in all, I mean, they do a little bit at the post credits where they show a little bit more of Mafia's relationship with Yuki, and it keeps making me wonder now if Yuki knew that he was going to die because the way that he talks to Mafia, because they're walking on a beach, and he doesn't want to leave right away because he wants to make sure Mafia remembers this day so that he doesn't forget it for like 10 years. And the way that it's worded, it could just be him just being a little bit more of a romantic, but you wonder if he knew something was up, if like there was illness coming into play, although they don't show anything. If you wonder if maybe he was really depressed anyway and something was really bugging him or like, even if he just knew something was up, you never know. It's one of those things that we're not gonna know Maybe at all. We Maybe we just never do. They just say he died, and they don't really tell you why or how. And it just kind of goes away like that. But all in all, this show, after nine episodes, went from a show that I was very just interested in and curious about because of the musical aspect of it, and it's become quite easily my favorite show this season. As much as I would love to put a show like Dr. Stone up there, uh, this show has just become the one show that I want to make sure I watch whenever I see an episode come up now. And to know that this will probably be a show that only goes this one season is sad, but also fitting in a way because it means that, you know, you're not going to get any more surprises. At this point, with only a few episodes to go, I think it's very unlikely you're going to get a fight, although it's, it's still possible. And because ro romance animes have to be what they are, there almost has to be some drama. But it feels like the drama is already centered around Yuki and his death, so... I don't know if they'll need to go that route. Now, if there is a second season and the band is actually, because the whole point of this of this show is them starting. 
So it makes me wonder if they would ever think about a second show where it's actually the band really taking a serious step and the relationship between Ritsuka and Mafia getting serious. It's possible, and that's where maybe you could do a fight angle because, I mean, it already happened with Mafia and Yuki, and it would be something Mafia has to overcome because he'll probably worry, thinking that, oh my god, I just pushed another one away. What if he leaves me too? There always is that. I hope they don't do it in this season because I think there's not enough time to really flesh it out. But, I mean, the show is, has impressed me thus far and been able to handle this subject material a lot better than most do, so I would definitely give it a chance. I just hope it doesn't take that chance at, at this juncture because I think it's too late, personally. But like I've said, this this at this point in time, unless the last three episodes or however many are left are just really poorly written to finish it off, I think this show is my show of the season without questioning. It, at this point, it is. It, there's no... Dr. Stone is second, but it's a far second at this point. So I, I'm very glad that the show has done a number on me and in a very good way. If it's for my daughter, I'd even defeat a demon lord. Three episodes to go, I believe, and it still hasn't leaned in on anything too gross or incesty, apparently, from what I've heard of people about the manga. But now we've gone through the them leaving cruise and seeing various sites, seeing the Beast Man family where uh, you get the, the little girl Maya who is apparently the biggest brat I've ever seen and will kick the shit out of you if you try to, if you try to hold her back. The crying got a little bit uncomfortable when they left the first time. The second time they were smart and only kept it to about five to ten seconds, whereas the, the first time they left to go to um, Dale's hometown. That was a long extended one. And I'm like, okay guys, like you can cut away from it now. This is getting a little ridiculous, but that was fine. It was still adorable, but the other stuff in between, like the one devil that came across in the seaside town, that was a slightly interesting thing. It puts a little bit more story into Latina's past. I'm still wondering if they're gonna do something bad here at the end. It's starting to wonder if it's going to be too late for that, but I mean, there's a few episodes to go, so they could probably try to rush something along. Um, but finally getting to the hometown, that was a mixed bag for me. There was a little bit going on, and then there was also a whole lot of nothing for a while, and more of just like, Latina's growing up, Dale's growing up. And I'm like, yeah, that's nice, but it's, it's not that interesting. The jokes weren't really hitting. The adorability that... Latino has shown for a while is starting to wear off and I'm now starting to look at this show and being like okay it can't just be an adorable father daughter anime anymore we need to start seeing something of substance otherwise this show is going to start to lose its course it's starting to lose its edge it's starting to lose its freshness and very much like the uh, do you like your mom anime it's getting to a point that when this show hits its end at the rate it's going, it's also going to be another show that I probably wouldn't see a second season of even if they offered it. Just because the way that it's going right now, if it stays on this course, it will have gotten old to me. And as much fun as I've had and as much smiling as I've done during the show, I feel like it's going to hit that point where I'm just like, okay, I get it. Dale is a little bit too crazy about his daughter. Can we just move on from that? And I don't know if I really have much else to say beyond that. There wasn't really any conflict in these last three episodes, so there really isn't too much to go on. So yeah, you know what? I'm not going to go too much further into it. There really isn't a whole lot extra to deal with. It's just, again, another show that while it isn't bad and doesn't deserve a drop it's just starting to get to that point where it's not going to do anything to make me like crave the next episode so as we move on here we have isekai cheat magician i kept mentioning to you guys that i was looking at the show that was going to be on the bottom and this is the one i'm not dropping it but the show has done almost nothing to really set itself apart this anime, unless it does something towards the end, is going to play the role of an anime that does nothing and just tries to get by on being a cliche, being an isekai. It's not doing anything different. It's not putting any real story out there that's interesting. The characters are fine. 
but it's it's not blowing me away. There's nothing that's got me fully attached to the show. And it's getting to a point where they're really struggling to invest me at this point. And I feel like they tried to do that with the death of Anastasia, which by the way, there's the two twins that he found and they've just suddenly disappeared off the face of the earth since. But Anastasia is a cliche in anime that I wish isn't a cliche. And it's, I don't know if people consider it a cliche, but it is for me. There are some shows out there that like to kill off small time characters just to elicit a reaction. And the problem with, with these specific moments is that they're characters that you haven't spent enough time with to have any value of. Not to mention they're characters that you don't feel like had much value. Anastasia is not really that interesting. They didn't really give her an arc at this point. She was a girl who tried to kill Taichi. Lost. And then became, I guess, a mercenary in a way. You know, helping the good guys. But in doing so, didn't necessarily look like she'd fully converted. She looked like somebody that was being used still and was going to betray them. And eventually just became someone that they could hypnotize and throw into danger and just end up being killed. Almost to put Tai Chi off. You know, to get him horrified of what it'll be like to, to see another human being die in front of him like that. And I get why that moment is there, but they didn't use somebody of value. If they had done it to Mura, that would be interesting. If they'd done it to, um, I can't believe I'm forgetting her name right now, but the black-haired girl, if they did that to her, that would have value. Anybody else, because you're not going to do it to Rin, it, it's inconsequential. There's nothing to it. Anastasia just became a character they shuffled in there just to have a name that they could kill off, and it didn't work. I don't know what other people thought about it, but in my opinion, it failed exponentially. I did not care. I did not feel anything other than, really, you're killing her off? Why? And it didn't work. And the anime itself has not worked. The show, while I'm, again, I don't hate it, and at this point I might as well finish it, has not done anything that I could consider worth talking about. It hasn't. They haven't done anything different with the Isekai license. They haven't done a storyline that is interesting. There isn't a villain that is interesting. None of the characters are truly that interesting other than the black-haired girl who is more just interesting because she's attractive, I guess. I mean, the first time you see her, she's walking around her underwear and Muir gets mad at her and says, why are you dressed like that? And she's like, it's my house. I can do what I want. I'm like, okay, I like you. I already like you at this point. But yeah, it's, it's one of those things where like they tried to do something to elicit a reaction and they didn't think that, you know, it's not really gonna work if the person is not that interesting or if the person is really not that high a value person. You know, there's only a couple of characters they could do that with at this juncture and they didn't do it. So that moment was inconsequential and doesn't mean anything. And thus the anime now at nine episodes just doesn't carry any value. It doesn't carry anything that interesting. Now we move on to Is It Wrong to Try to Pick Up Girls in the Dungeon Season 2? And I still... I'm at the point now that as as much as I'm enjoying the, ep- the episodes at this time, I am very frustrated with this anime. Because, I like I said before, they never really have touched the dungeon. It's been a war with the Apollo family, and now it's essentially a war with the Ishtar family. To me, the entire story of Bell has been wasted in this season. People, I guess, will try to be like, well, you see, it's it's helping him understand this and this. I'm like, he's not growing, though. He really isn't. I don't feel like Bell's growing. He's not becoming a better adventurer. He's just dealing with... He's dealing with side arcs. 
Like, this entire season has been, like, a side arc. There's no main arc to the season. People, tr- like, if you try to tell me the Haruhime thing right now is the main arc of the show, you're, you're wrong. The main arc of the show has always been his journey to becoming a better adventurer and, in the way, trying to get himself so bu- so good that he will one day be able to save Ice to return the favor. That's been the gist of his journey. He was saved at the very beginning of his time as an adventurer, and he wants to better himself so he doesn't have to be saved again, and so that the person that he idolizes so much as an adventurer, he can get back, he can give back to her, and show that he is at her level. And probably will be at one point, but right now this entire season has been devoted to petty drama, and it's not been interesting. I've had fun with certain pieces of this season, but the episodes themselves, the stories that they're telling, don't mean shit. They're just distractions. They're all things that bring nothing to the table when they're done. The only thing the Apollo arc did was give them an actual home base. And slowly started the change of the Hestia family having members. I don't know what the Ishtar family is going to do for the Hestia family when this is done. Because they're not going to get another sudden influx of members because the debt is now well known. So unless the debt is paid off, it's useless. And by the way, we know that Cassandra and Daphne are basically gone to the back right now because I've read that they joined the, um, oh my god, the Miok family with um, with um, Naza. So... Any of the other characters we thought might convert later, they're not coming. And at this point, the only character in the entire series that would make any sense to be a member of the Hestia family would be Ryu. And we haven't seen a a bit of her this entire season except for the very beginning. Even the usual suspects we've seen, like Ina's barely been around, Seer's been barely around, um, most... Actually, you know what? The most annoying thing about this season is that the Loki family has basically had zero presence. Ice trained him a little bit for the war game, and that's literally been the gist of it. We've seen Ice, I think, for two episodes this entire time. That's really bad. The fact that they have not gotten involved in any aspect, they haven't even had them talking in the last, what, four, five, six episodes, is a travesty, and it's a waste of the character base they have. They've spent so much time introducing all these random Amazons that are not going to mean anything in a few more episodes and not concentrating on anybody else. And again, I don't hate the show, but I am very upset with it because it's been wasting the time that it's had to really push some good stuff forward. Because it seems like they were so hell-bent on concentrating on other stuff. Like, they had all these little side stories they really wanted to do. And as I look at them, I'm thinking, they're not... The Ishtar thing didn't need to be this long, almost six-episode thing we've gotten now. And most of the characters that have been a part of it also have not been very good. Aisha is not interesting at all. There's the... Is it it Frene? The really ugly, like, giant fat like friggin blob of a of a anime cliche character they have almost looks like somebody that came out of a studio ghibli show she has been a waste uh the new one that they just brought in samira the gray hair girl literally means nothing and she got her ass handed to her right away um there's the other one that had the orange jacket and the white crop top i can't remember her name right now she's just kind of been there and quickly dealt like Ishtar even has not been that interesting. Ishtar has literally been like, look, here I am naked. That's been her character. It doesn't it hasn't added anything. This entire Ishtar arc has not done anything. Even Haruhime by the end of this, unless she changes after she is away from that family, because assuming she keeps going. Even if she joins up with the Hestia family or whatever happens, I'm not convinced that she's even going to be that interesting of character because I don't know if her attitudes, if her personality is going to change that much outside of it. So all of what we've had in the last, especially four, five, six episodes has been kind of a waste. 
And it's sad because I really do like the show and I still do. But I feel like instead of really enjoying this season, I've actually spent more time frustrated at what they haven't done with this season. And as we get towards the end, I really hope they do they finish this this angle in the last epi- in this fu- in this next episode, episode 10, and then whatever they do in the last little bit is either fan servicey, and I don't mean like fan servicey is etchy, I mean like doing stuff that's more fun into the side and lead into whatever they want to do next because I'm pretty sure this is a 12 or 13 episode season. I just want them to be smart about it and not waste the rest of the season on this arc because it's been terrible, in my opinion. And then last but not least, we'll have Magical Senpai. Um, I will quickly go through this because I need to get going in a moment, but this has been a show that has gotten better and better as the episodes go on. I've become a lot more happy with Tejina than most other characters. Her, her and assistant have been the runaways. I mean, the one science girl in the last episode we had was really fun. The two street performers, I forget their names because I don't care about them. They have not added anything. I was really disappointed to see that. But thankfully, our main characters have up the ante, have been better. And a lot of the jokes have been funnier and a little more adorable. And I'm actually, she's actually starting to grow on me. But all in all, like I've said before, it's just a comedy short. Like you're not going to get anything too thought-provoking, too interesting. You're not going to have to remember anything. It's just a comedy short. It's nothing special. The comedy's fine. And, you know, because there's nothing really to spoil here. It's just, it's a fun show if you're can if you okay with a little bit of etchy. That's it. So I'm going to end it here. So we are going to have one more episode and that will only come when every show, other than Dr. Stone, which I believe is the one that will keep going, it, until every other show finishes, there will not be another episode. So if there's an epi- there's a couple of shows with 13 episodes, this will take four weeks before we get this next episode out. So after that, I plan on doing s- some sort of a preview, and this is going to be more me looking at what's coming on live chart because I don't think Crunchyroll will tell us right away what they've got so I won't know right away what shows are starting but I will probably go through the live chart list for the fall and just say hey I'm looking forward to this hopefully I can see that but the one thing I will say when I finish here is I haven't said this on this show because I want to do a full review of it as its own thing but when I went to Con Bravo and talked with Arcada, aka Glass Reflections on YouTube, he told me that I should watch Vinland Saga. And I was very distant about that idea because I knew it was being done by the Attack on Titan team and that show really did not gel well with me, mostly because I don't handle violence very well when it comes to gore. I can handle stuff like Helsing because it's over the top and silly, but this stuff with Attack on Titan was very serious and I don't usually take very well to it. So I was hesitant, and then I finally got a chance to start watching it, and I fucking adore that show. And I didn't want to add it this episode as being the first time I've gone through. I'm at episode 7, I believe, is where I'm at currently, because I've been kind of watching that on my own time, outside of my usual anime watching for the for the podcast. But I don't know how long that, se- that show's going for seasonally, but I hope that at some point I can do a review specifically dedicated to just that one show because there's a lot to go through with that one and i've been really happy with it so i just wanted to say that before i get out of here so anyways thanks for watching guys you can like this video and subscribe to the channel for more content you can also leave comments below if you have any thoughts about shows that you are watching that aren't on this list or things that are on this list if you have thoughts about you know what i've said and if maybe you think i'm wrong or i'm missing out on something maybe there's something i didn't catch who knows And then, of course, share this with all your friends and make sure you let them know about the best religion in all of YouTube. And as well, you can follow me on Twitter at CS Radical, where you can get more stuff from me. Usually it's not too, too much because I don't take to Twitter very often because Twitter's kind of a shithole at times and there's no reason to go too deep into it. But with that being said, guys, thanks for watching this episode of The Church of Weeb. And I will see you next time.